Chapter 20, Battles and Sieges, 1219 to 1220. After the fall of Bokhara and Otrar, the war was continued for two years with great vigor by Genghis Khan and the Mongols, and the poor sultan was driven from place to place by his merciless enemies, until at last his cause was wholly lost, and he himself, as will appear in the next chapter, came to a miserable end. During the two years while Genghis Khan continued the war against him, a great many incidents occurred illustrating the modes of warfare practiced in those days and the sufferings which were endured by the mass of the people in consequence of these terrible struggles between rival despots contending for the privilege of governing them. At one time Genghis Khan sent his son Juki with a large detachment to besiege and take a certain town named Saganak. As soon as Juki arrived before the place, he sent in a flag of truce to call upon the people of the town to surrender, promising, at the same time, to treat them kindly if they would do so. The bearer of the flag was a Mohammedan named Hassan. Juki probably thought that the message would be better received by the people of the town if brought to them by one of their own countrymen. But he made a great mistake in this. The people, instead of being pleased with the messenger because he was a Mohammedan, were very much exasperated against him. They considered him a renegade and a traitor, and although the governor had solemnly promised that he should be allowed to go and come in safety, so great a tumult arose that the governor found it impossible to protect him, and the poor man was torn to pieces by the mob. Juki immediately assaulted the town with all his force, and as soon as he got possession of it, he slaughtered without mercy all the officers and soldiers of the garrison, and killed also about one-half of the inhabitants in order to avenge the death of his murdered messenger. He also caused a handsome monument to be erected to his memory in the principal square of the town. Juki treated the inhabitants of every town that dared to resist with extreme severity, while those that yielded at once were, in some degree, spared and protected. The consequence of this policy was that the people of many towns surrendered without attempting to defend themselves at all. In one case, the magistrates and other principal inhabitants of a town came out to meet him at a distance of two days' journey from them, bringing with them the keys of the town and a great quantity of magnificent presents, all of which they laid at the conqueror's feet and implored his mercy. There was one town which Juki's force took by a kind of stratagem. A certain engineer, whom he employed to make a reconnaissance of the fortifications, reported that there was a place on one side of the town where there was a ditch full of water outside of the wall, which made the access to the wall there so difficult that the garrison would not be at all likely to expect an attack on that side. The engineer proposed a plan for building some light bridges which the soldiers were to throw over the ditch in the night after having drawn off the attention of the garrison to some other quarter, and then mounting upon the walls by means of ladders to get into the town. This plan was adopted. The bridges and the ladders were prepared, and then when the appointed night came, a feigned attack was made in the opposite part of the town. The garrison were then all called off to repel this pretended attack, and in this way the wall opposite to the ditch was left undefended. The soldiers then threw the bridges over the ditch and planted the ladders against the wall, and before the garrison could get intelligence of what they were doing, they had made their way into the town and had opened one of the gates, and by this means the whole army got in. The engineer himself who had proposed the plan, went up first on the first ladder that was planted against the wall. To take the lead in such an escalade required great coolness and courage, for it was dark, and no one knew in going up the ladder 
how many enemies he might have to encounter at the top of it. The next place which the army of Juki approached was a quiet and beautiful town, the seat of several institutions of learning, and the residence of learned men and men of leisure. It was a very pleasant place, full of fountains, gardens, and delightful pleasure grounds, with many charming public and private promenades. The name of this place was Tukat, and the beauty and attractiveness of it were proverbial through all the country. Tukat was a place rather of pleasure than of strength, and yet it was surrounded by a wall, and the governor of it determined to make an effort to defend it. The garrison fought bravely, and they kept the besiegers off for three days. At the end of that time the engines of the Mongols had made so many breaches in the walls that the governor was convinced that they would soon get in, and so he sent to Juki to ask for the terms on which he would allow them to surrender. Juki replied that he would not now make any terms with him at all. It was too late. He ought to have surrendered at the beginning. So the Mongol army forced its way into the town and slaughtered the whole garrison without mercy. Juki then ordered all the inhabitants, men, women, and children, to repair to a certain place on the plain outside the walls. In obedience to this command, all the people went to the appointed place. They went with fear and trembling, expecting that they were all to be killed. But they found in the end that the object of Juki in bringing them thus out of the town was not to kill them, but only to call them away from the houses, so that the soldiers could plunder them more conveniently while the owners were away. After being kept out of the town for a time, they were allowed to return, and when they went back to their houses, they found that they had been pillaged and stripped of everything that the soldiers could carry away. There was another large and important town named Kojend. It was situated two or three hundred miles to the northward of Samarkand on the river Sur, which flows into Aral Lake. The governor of this city was Timur Melek. He was a very powerful chieftain and a man of great military renown, having often been in active service under the sultan as one of the principal generals of his army. When Timur heard of the fall of Tukat, he presumed that his city of Kojend would be next attacked, as it seemed to come next in the way of the Mongol army, so he began to make vigorous preparations for defense. He broke up all the roads leading toward the town and destroyed the bridges. He also laid in great supplies of food to maintain the inhabitants in case of a protracted siege, and he ordered all the corn, fruits, and cattle of the surrounding country, which he did not require for this purpose, to be taken away and stowed in secret places at a distance to prevent their falling into the hands of the enemy. Juki did not himself attack this town, but sent a large detachment under the orders of a general named Elak Nevian. Elak advanced toward the city and commenced his operations. The first thing that was to be done was to rebuild a bridge over the river so as to enable him to gain access to the town, which was on the opposite bank. Then he set up immense engines at different points along the line, some of which were employed to batter down the walls and others at the same time to throw stones, darts, and arrows over the parapets in order to drive the garrison back from them. These engines did great execution. Those built to batter down the walls were of great size and power. Some of them, it was said, threw stones over the wall as big as millstones. Timur Melek was equally active in the defense of the town. He built a number of flat-bottom boats, which might be called floating batteries, since they were constructed for throwing missiles of all sorts into the camp of the enemy. These batteries, it is said, were covered over the top to protect the men, and they had portholes in the sides, like a modern man-of-war, out of which, not cannonballs and bombshells indeed, but arrows, darts, javelins, and stones were projected. The boats were sent out, some on the upper side of the town and some on the lower, and were placed in stations where they could most effectually 
reached the Mongols works. They were the means of killing and wounding great multitudes of men, and they greatly disturbed and hindered the besiegers' operations. Still Elak persevered. He endeavored to shut up the city on every side as closely as possible. But there was on one side a large morass or jungle which he could not guard, and Timur received a great many reinforcements to take the place of the men who were killed on the walls by that way. In the meantime, however, Elak was continually receiving reinforcements, too, from Prince Juhi, who was not at a great distance, and thus the struggle was continued with great fury. At last Timur contrived an ingenious stratagem by which he hoped to cause his enemy to fall into a snare. It seems that there was a small island in the river, not far from the walls of the city, on which, before the siege commenced, Timur had built a fortress, to be held as a sort of advanced post, and had garrisoned the fortress with about one thousand men. Timur now, in order to divert the attention of the Mongols from the city itself, sent a number of men out from the city who pretended to be deserters, and went immediately to the Mongol camp. Of course, Elak questioned them about the defenses of the city in order to learn where the weak points were for him to attack. The pretended deserters advised him to attack this fortress on the island, saying that it could very easily be taken, and that its situation was such that, when it was taken, the city itself must surrender, for it completely commanded the place. So Elak caused his principal engines to be removed to the bank of the river, opposite the island, and employed all his energies and spent all his ammunition in shooting at the fortress. But the river was so wide, and the walls of the fortress were so thick and so high, that he made very little impression. At last his whole supply of stones, for stones served in those days instead of cannonballs, was exhausted, and as the town was situated in an alluvial district in which no stones were to be found, he was obliged to send ten or twelve miles to the upland to procure a fresh supply of ammunition. All this consumed much time, and enabled the garrison to recruit themselves a great deal, and to strengthen their defenses. The operations of the siege were in a great measure suspended, while the men were obtaining a new supply of stones, and the whole disposable force of the army was employed in going back and forth to bring them. At length an immense quantity were collected, but then the Mongol general changed his plan. Instead of throwing the stones from his engines toward the fortress on the island, which it had been proved was beyond his reach, he determined to build out a jetty into the river towards it, so as to get a standpoint for his engines nearer the walls, where they could have some chance of doing execution. So he set his men at work to prepare fascines and bundles and rafts of timber, which were to be loaded with the stones and sunk in the river to form the foundation for the proposed bank. The men would bring the stones down to the bank in their hands, and then horsemen, who were ready on the brink, would take them, and resting them on the saddle, would drive their horses in until they came near the place where the stones were to go, when they would throw them down, and then return for others. In this way they would work upon the jetty in many parts at once, some being employed in building at the end, where it abutted on the shore, while the horsemen were laying the foundations at the same time out in the middle of the stream. The work of the horsemen was very difficult and dangerous, on account of holes in the sandy bottom of the river, into which they were continually sinking. Besides this, the garrison on the walls were doing their utmost all the time to impede the work by shooting arrows, javelins, stones, and fiery darts among the workmen, by which means vast numbers, both of men and horses, were killed. The Mongols, however, persevered, and notwithstanding all the opposition which the garrison made, they succeeded in advancing the mole which they were building so far that Timur was convinced that they would soon gain so advantageous a position that it would be impossible for him to hold out against them. 
so he determined to attempt to make his escape. His plan was to embark on board his boats with all his men and go down the river in the night. In order to prepare for this undertaking, he employed his men secretly in building more boats until he had in all more than seventy. These boats were kept out of sight in hidden places in the river until all were ready. Each of them was covered with a sort of heavy awning or roof made of wet felt, which was plastered over a coating of clay and vinegar. This covering was intended both to defend the men from missiles and the boats themselves from being set on fire. There was one obstacle to the escape of the boats which it was necessary to remove beforehand, and that was the bridge which the Mongols had built across the river just below the town when they first came to besiege it. To destroy this bridge, Timur one night made a sally from one of the gates and attacked the men who were stationed to guard the bridge. At the same time, he sent down the current of the river a number of great flat-bottomed boats filled with combustibles of various kinds mixed with tar and naphtha. These combustibles were set on fire before they were launched, and as the current of the river bore them down one after another against the bridge, they set the wooden piers and posts that supported it on fire, while the guard, being engaged with the party which had sallied from the town, could not go extinguish the flames, and thus the bridge was consumed. The way being thus opened, Timur Melek very soon afterward embarked his family and the greater part of his army on board the boats in the night, and while the Mongols had no suspicion of what was going on, the boats were launched and sent off one after another swiftly down the stream. Before morning came, all traces of the party had passed away. Very soon, however, the Mongol general heard how his intended prey had escaped him, and he immediately sent off a strong detachment to follow the southern bank of the river and pursue the fugitives. The detachment soon overtook them, and then a furious battle ensued between the Mongol horsemen on the banks and in the margin of the water and the men in the boats, who kept the boats all the time as near as possible to the northern shore. Sometimes, however, when the stream was narrow, or when a rocky point projected from the northern shore so as to drive the boats nearer to the Mongol side, the battle became very fierce and bloody. The Mongols drove their horses far into the water so as to be as near as possible to the boats, and threw arrows, javelins, and fiery darts at them, while the Mohammedans defended themselves as well as they could from their windows or portholes. Things went on this way for some time, until, at length, the boats arrived at a part of the river where the water was so shallow, being obstructed by sandbars and shoals, that the boats fell aground. There was nothing now for Timur to do but to abandon the boats and escape with his men to the land. This he succeeded in doing, and after reaching the shore he was able to form his men in array on an elevated piece of ground before Elak could bring up a sufficient number of men to attack him. When the Mongols at length came to attack him, he beat them off in the first instance, but he was obliged soon afterwards to leave the field and continue his retreat. Of course, he was hotly pursued by the Mongols. His men became rapidly thinned in number, some being killed, and others getting separated from the main body in the confusion of the flight, until, at last, Timur was left almost alone. At last he was himself on the very point of being taken. There were three Mongols closely pursuing him. He turned round and shot an arrow at the foremost of the pursuers. The arrow struck the Mongol in the eye. The agony which the wounded man felt was so great that the two others stopped to assist him, and in the meantime Timur got out of the way. In due time, and after meeting with some other hairbreadth escapes, he reached the camp of the sultan, who received him very joyfully, loaded him with praises for the indomitable spirit which he had evinced, and immediately made him governor of another city. In the meantime, some of the boats which had been abandoned by the soldiers were got off by the men who had been left in charge of them 
one especially which contained the family of Timur. This boat went quietly down the river and conveyed the family to a place of safety. The city of Kojand, from which Timur and his men had fled, was, of course, now without any means of defense, and it surrendered the very next day to the Mongols. End of chapter 20 Chapter 21 Death of the Sultan, 1220 In the meantime, while Juki and the other generals were ravaging the country with their detachments and besieging and capturing all the secondary towns and fortresses that came in their way, as related in the last chapter, Genghis Khan himself, with the main body of the army, had advanced to Samarkand in pursuit of the sultan, who had, as he supposed, taken shelter there. Samarkand was the capital of the country, and was then, as it has been since, a great and renowned city. Besides the sultan himself, whom Genghis Khan was pursuing, there were the ladies of his family, whom he wished also to capture. The two principal ladies were the sultana and the queen mother. The queen mother was a lady of very great distinction. She had been greatly renowned during the lifetime of her husband, the former sultan, for her learning, her piety, the kindness of her heart, and the general excellence of her character, so far as her dealings with her subjects and friends were concerned, and her influence throughout the realm had been unbounded. At some periods of her life, she had exercised a great deal of political power, and at one time she bore the very grand title of Protectress of the Faith of the World. She exercised the power which she then possessed, in the main, in a very wise and beneficial manner. She administered justice impartially. She protected the weak and restrained the oppressions of the strong. She listened to all the cases which were brought before her with great attention and patience, and arrived almost always at just conclusions respecting them. With all this, however, she was very strict and severe, and, as has almost always been the case with women raised to the possession of irresponsible power, she was unrelenting and cruel in the extreme whenever, as she judged, any political necessity required her to act with decision. Her name was Khatun. Khatun was not now at Samarkand. She was at Karazm, a city which was the chief residence of the court. She had been living there in retirement ever since the death of her husband, the present sultan's father. Samarkand itself, as has already been said, was a great and splendid city. Like most of the other cities, it was enclosed in a double wall, though in this case the outer wall surrounded the whole city, while the inner one enclosed the mosque, the palace of the sultan, and some other public buildings. These walls were much better built and more strongly fortified than those of Bokhara. There were twelve iron gates, it is said, in the outer wall. These gates were a league apart from each other. At every two leagues along the wall was a fort capable of containing a large body of men. The walls were likewise strengthened with battlements and towers, in which the men could fight under shelter, and they were surrounded by a broad and deep ditch to prevent an army from approaching too near to them, in order to undermine them or batter them down. The city was abundantly supplied with water, by means of hydraulic constructions as perfect and complete as could be made in those days. The water was brought by leaden pipes from a stream which came down from the mountains at some distance from the town. It was conveyed by these pipes to every part of the town and was distributed freely, so that every great street had a little current of water running through it, and every house a fountain in the court or garden. Besides this, in a public square or park, there was a mound where the water was made to spout up in the center, and then flow down in little rivulets and cascades on every side. The gates and towers, which have been described, 
were in the outer wall, and beyond them in the environs were a great many fields, gardens, orchards, and beautifully cultivated grounds, which produced fruits of all sorts, that were sent by the merchants into all the neighboring countries. At a little distance the town was almost entirely concealed from view by these gardens and orchards, there being nothing to be seen but minarets and some of the loftier roofs of the houses rising above the tops of the trees. There were so many people who flocked into Samarkand from the surrounding country for shelter and protection when they learned that Genghis Khan was coming that the place would hardly contain them. In addition to these, the sultan sent over 100,000 troops to defend the town, with 30 generals to command them. There were 20 large elephants, too, that were brought with the army to be employed in any service which might be required of them during the siege. This army, however, instead of entering the city at once, encamped about it. They strengthened the position of the camp by a deep ditch which they dug, throwing up the earth from the ditch on the side toward the camp, so as to form a redoubt with which to defend the ground from the Mongols. But as soon as Genghis Khan arrived, they were speedily driven from this post and forced to take shelter within the walls of the city. Here they defended themselves with so much vigor and resolution that Genghis Khan would probably have found it very difficult to take the town had it not been for dissensions within the walls. It seems that the rich merchants and other wealthy men of the city, being convinced that the place would sooner or later fall into the hands of the Mongols, thought it would be better to surrender it at once, while they were in a condition to make some terms by which they might hope to save their lives and perhaps their property. But the generals would not listen to any proposition of this kind. They had been sent by the sultan to defend the town, and they felt bound in honor, in obedience to their orders, to fight in defense of it to the last extremity. The dissension within the city grew more and more violent every day, until at length the party of the inhabitants grew so strong and decided that they finally took possession of one of the gates and sent a large deputation consisting of priests, magistrates, and some of the principal citizens to Genghis Khan, bearing with them the keys of the town, and proposing to deliver them up to him if he would spare the garrison and the inhabitants. But he said he would make no terms, except with those who were of their party and were willing to surrender. In respect to the generals and the soldiers of the garrison, he would make no promises. The deputation gave up the keys, and Genghis Khan entered the city. The inhabitants were spared, but the soldiers were massacred whenever they could be found. A great many perished in the streets. A considerable body of them, however, with the governor at their head, retreated within the inner wall, and there defended themselves desperately for four days. At the end of that time, finding that their case was hopeless, and knowing that they could expect no quarter from the Mongols in any event, they resolved to make a sally and cut their way through the ranks of their enemies at all hazards. The governor, accordingly, put himself at the head of a troop of one thousand horse, and coming out suddenly from his retreat, he dashed through the camp at a time when the Mongols were off their guard, and so gained the open country and made his escape. All the soldiers that remained behind in the city were immediately put to the sword. In the meantime, the sultan himself, finding that his affairs were going to ruin, retreated from province to province, accompanied by as large a force as he could keep together, and vainly seeking to find some place of safety. He had several sons, and among them two whose titles were Jalaladin and Kotbadin. Jalaladin was the oldest, and was therefore naturally entitled to be his father's successor. But for some reason or other, the queen mother, Khatun, had taken a dislike to him, and had persuaded her son, the sultan, to execute a sort of act or deed by which Jalaladin was displaced, and Kotbadin, who was a great favorite of hers, was made heir to the throne in his place. <laughs>
The sultan had other sons who were governors of different provinces, and he fled from one to another of these, seeking in vain for some safe retreat. But he could find none. He was hunted from place to place by detachments of the Mongols, and the number of his attendants and followers was continually diminishing, until at last he began to be completely discouraged. At length, at one of the cities where he made a short stay, he delivered to an officer named Omar, who was the steward of his household, ten coffers sealed with the royal signet, with instructions to take them secretly to a certain distant fortress and lock them up carefully there, without allowing anyone to know that he did it. These coffers contained the royal jewels, and they were of inestimable value. After this, one of his sons joined him with quite a large force, but very soon a large body of Mongols came up, and, after a furious battle, the sultan's troops were defeated and scattered in all directions, and he was again obliged to fly, accompanied by a very small body of officers, who still contrived to keep near him. With these, he succeeded at last in reaching a very retired town near the Caspian Sea, where he hoped to remain concealed. His strength was now spent, and all his courage gone. He sank down in a condition of the greatest despondency and distress, and spent his time in going to the mosque, and offering up prayers to God to save him from total ruin. He made confession of his sins, and promised an entire amendment of life if the Almighty would deliver him from his enemies and restore him to his throne. At last the Mongol detachment that was in pursuit of him in that part of the country were informed by a peasant where he was, and one day, while he was at his prayers in the mosque, word was brought to him that the Mongols were coming. He rushed out of the mosque, and guided by some friends, ran down to the shore and got into a boat, with a view of escaping by sea, all retreat by land being now cut off. He had scarce got on board the boat when the Mongols appeared on the shore. The men in the boat immediately pushed off. The Mongols, full of disappointment and rage, shot at them with their arrows, but the sultan was not struck by any of them and was soon out of reach of his pursuers. The sultan lay in the boat almost helpless, being perfectly exhausted by the terror and distress which he had endured. He soon began to suffer, too, from an intense pain in the chest and side, which gradually became so severe that he could scarcely breathe. The men with him in the boat, finding that he was seriously sick, made the best of their way to a small island named Abiskan, which is situated near the southeastern corner of the sea. Here they pitched a tent and made up a bed in it as well as they could for the sufferer. They also sent a messenger to the shore to bring off a physician secretly. The physician did all that was in his power, but it was too late. The inflammation and the pain subsided after a time, but it was evident that the patient was sinking and that he was about to die. It happened that the sultan's son, Jalaluddin, the one who had been set aside in favor of his brother, Kothbaden, was at this time on the mainland not far from the island, and intelligence was communicated to him of his father's situation. He immediately went to the island to see him, taking with him two of his brothers. They were obliged to manage the business very secretly to prevent the Mongols from finding out what was going on. On the arrival of Jalaluddin, the sultan expressed great satisfaction in seeing him, and he revoked the decree by which he had been superseded in the succession. You, my son, said he, are, after all, the one among all my children who is best able to revenge me on the Mongols. Therefore, I revoke the act which I formerly executed at the request of the queen, my mother, in favor of Kothbaden. He then solemnly appointed Jalaluddin to be his successor, and enjoined upon the other princes to be obedient and faithful to him as their sovereign. He also formally delivered to him his sword, 
as the emblem and badge of the supreme power which he thus conferred upon him. Soon after this, the sultan expired. The attendants buried the body secretly on the island for fear of the Mongols. They washed it carefully before the interment, according to custom, and then put on again a portion of the same dress which the sultan had worn when living, having no means of procuring or making any other shroud. As for Cotton, the queen mother, when she heard the tidings of her son's death, and was informed at the same time that her favorite, Kothbaden, had been set aside, and Jalaluddin, whom she hated, and who she presumed hated her, had been made his successor, she was in a great rage. She was at that time at Karazm, which was the capital, and she attempted to persuade the officers and soldiers near her not to submit to the sultan's decree, but to make Kothbaden their sovereign after all. While she was engaged in forming this conspiracy, the news reached the city that the Mongols were coming. Khatun immediately determined to flee to save her life. She had, it seems, in her custody at Karazm, twelve children, the sons of various princes that reigned in different parts of the empire or in the environs of it. These children were either held as hostages or had been made captive in insurrections and wars and were retained in prison as a punishment to their fathers. The queen mother found that she could not take these children with her, and so she ordered them all to be slain. She was afraid that the Mongols, when they came, might set them free. As soon as she was gone, the city fell into great confusion on account of the struggles for power between the two parties of Jalaluddin and Kothbaden. But the sultana, who had made the mischief, did not trouble herself to know how it would end. Her only anxiety was to save her own life. After various wanderings and adventures, she at last found her way into a very retired district of country lying on the southern shore of the Caspian, between the mountains and the sea, and here she sought refuge in a castle or fortress named Elan, where she thought she was secure from all pursuit. She brought with her to the castle her jewels and all her most valuable treasures. But Genghis Khan had spies in every part of the country, and he was soon informed where Khatun was concealed. So he sent a messenger to a certain Mongol general named Huba Nevian, who was commanding a detachment in that part of the country, informing him that Khatun was in the castle of Ilan, and commanding him to go and lay siege to it, and to take it at all hazards, and to bring Khatun to him either dead or alive. Huba immediately set off for the castle. The queen mother, however, had notice of his approach, and the lords who were with her urged her to fly. If she would go with them, they said, they would take her to Jalaluddin, and he would protect her. But she would not listen to any such proposal. She hated Jalaluddin so intensely that she would not, even to save her life, put herself under his power. The very worst possible treatment, she said, that she could receive from the Mongols would be more agreeable to her than the greatest favors from the hand of Jalaluddin. The ground of this extreme animosity, which she felt toward Jalaluddin, was not any personal animosity to him. It arose simply from an ancient and long-continued dislike and hatred which she had borne against his mother. So Khatun refused to retire from the danger, and soon afterward the horde of Mongols arrived and pitched their camp before the castle walls. For three months Huba and his Mongols continued to ply the walls of the fortress with battering rams and other engines in order to force their way in, but in vain. The place was too strong for them. At length Genghis Khan, hearing how the case stood, sent word to them to give up the attempt to make a breach, and to invest the place closely on all sides, so as to allow no person to go out or to come in. In that way, he said, the garrison would soon be starved into a surrender. When the governor of the castle saw, by the arrangements which Huba made in obedience to this order, 
that this was the course that was to be pursued, he said he was not uneasy, for his magazines were full of provisions, and as to water, the rain which fell very copiously there among the mountains always afforded an abundant supply. But the governor was mistaken in his calculations in respect to the rain. It usually fell very frequently in that region, but after the blockade of the fortress commenced for three weeks there was not the smallest shower. The people of the country around thought this failure of the rain was a special judgment of heaven against the queen for the murder of the children and for her various other crimes. It was indeed remarkable, for in ordinary times the rain was so frequent that the people of all that region depended upon it entirely for their supply of water and never found it necessary to search for springs or to dig wells. The sufferings of the people within the fortress for want of water were very great. Many of them died in great misery, and at length the provisions began to fail too, and Cotton was compelled to allow the governor to surrender. The Mongols immediately seized the queen and took possession of all her treasures. They also took captive all the lords and ladies who had attended her and the women of her household and two or three of her great-grandchildren whom she had brought with her in her flight. All these persons were sent under a strong guard to Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan retained the queen as a captive for some time and treated her in a very cruel and barbarous manner. He would sometimes order her to be brought into his tent at the end of his dinner, that he might enjoy his triumph by insulting and deriding her. On these occasions he would throw her scraps of food from the table as if she had been a dog. He took away the children from her too, all but one, whom he left with her a while to comfort her, as he said. But one day an officer came and seized this one from her very arms while she was dressing him and combing his hair. This last blow caused her a severer pang than any that she had before endured, and left her utterly disconsolate and heartbroken. Some accounts say that soon after this she was put to death, but others state that Genghis Khan retained her several years as a captive and carried her to and fro in triumph in his train through the countries over which she had formerly reigned with so much power and splendor. She deserved her sufferings, it is true, but Genghis Khan was none the less guilty on that account for treating her so cruelly. End of chapter 21 Chapter 22, Victorious Campaigns, 1220 to 1221. After this, Genghis Khan went on successfully for several years, extending his conquests over all the western part of Central Asia, while the generals whom he had left at home were extending his dominions in the same manner in the eastern portion. He overran nearly all of Persia, went entirely around the Caspian Sea, and even approached the confines of India. In this expedition toward India, he was in pursuit of Jalaluddin. Immediately after the death of his father, Jalaluddin had done all in his power to raise an army and carry on the war against Genghis Khan. He met with a great deal of embarrassment and difficulty at first, on account of the plots and conspiracies which his grandmother had organized in favor of his brother, Kothbaden, and the dissensions among his people to which they gave rise. At last, in the course of a year, he succeeded in some measure in healing this breach and in raising an army. And though he was not strong enough to fight the Mongols in a general battle, he hung about them in their march and harassed them in various ways so as to impede their operations very essentially. Genghis Khan, from time to time, sent off detachments from his army to take him. He was often defeated in the engagements which ensued, but he always succeeded in saving himself and in keeping together a portion of his men, and thus he maintained himself in the field, though he was growing weaker and weaker all the time. 
At last he became completely discouraged, and after signal defeat, which he met with from a detachment which had been sent against him by Genghis Khan, he went, with the few troops that remained together, to a strong fortress among the mountains, and told the governor that it seemed to him useless to continue the struggle any longer, and that he had come to shut himself up in the fortress and abandon the contest in despair. The governor, however, told him that it was not right for a prince, the descendant of ancestors so illustrious as his, and the inheritor of so resplendent a crown, to yield to discouragement and despondency on account of the reverses of fortune. He advised him again to take the field, and to raise a new army, and continue the contest to the end. Jalaluddin determined to follow this advice, and after a brief period of repose at the castle, he again took the field. He made great exertions, and finally succeeded in getting together about 20,000 men. This was a small force, it is true, compared with the numbers of the enemy, but it was sufficient, if well managed, to enable the prince to undertake operations of considerable importance, and Jalaluddin began to feel somewhat encouraged again. With his 20,000 men, he gained one or two victories, too, which encouraged him still more. In one of these cases, he defeated rather a singular stratagem which the Mongol general contrived. It seems that the Mongol detachment, which was sent out in this instance against Jalaluddin, was not strong enough, and the general, in order to make Jalaluddin believe that his force was greater than it really was, ordered all the felt caps and cloaks that there were in the army to be stuffed with straw and placed on the horses and camels of the baggage, in order to give the appearance of a second line of reserve in the rear of the line of real soldiers. This was to induce Jalaluddin to surrender without fighting. But in some way or other Jalaluddin detected the deceit, and instead of surrendering, fought the Mongols with great vigor and defeated them. He gained a very decided victory, and perhaps this might have been the beginning of a change of fortune for him if, unfortunately, his generals had not quarreled about the division of the spoil. There was a beautiful Arabian horse, which two of his leading generals desired to possess, and each claimed it. The dispute became at last so violent that one of the generals struck the other in his face with the lash of his whip. Upon this the feud became a deadly one. Both parties appealed to Jalaluddin. He did not wish to make either general an enemy by deciding in favor of the other, and so he tried to compromise the matter. He did not succeed in doing this, and one of the generals, mortally offended, went off in the night, taking with him all that portion of the troops which was under his command. Jalaluddin did everything in his power to bring the disaffected general back again, but before he could accomplish this purpose, Genghis Khan came up with a large force between the two parties and prevented their effecting a junction. Jalaluddin had now no alternative but to retreat. Genghis Khan followed him, and it was in this way that, after a time, both the armies reached the banks of the Indus on the borders of India. Jalaluddin, being closely pursued, took his position in a narrow defile near the bank of the river, and here a great battle was fought among the rocks and precipices. Jalaluddin, it is said, had only 30,000 men at his command, while Genghis Khan was at the head of an army of 300,000. The numbers in both cases are probably greatly exaggerated, but the proportion may perhaps be true. It was only a small portion of the Mongol army that could get into the defile where the sultan's troops had posted themselves, and so desperately did the latter fight that it is said they killed 20,000 of the Mongols before they gave in. In fact, they fought like wild beasts, with desperate and unremitting fury, all day long. Toward night, it became evident to Jalaluddin that it was all over with him. A large portion of his followers were killed. Some had made their escape across the river, 
though many of those who sought to do so were drowned in the attempt. The rest of his men were completely exhausted and discouraged, and wholly unable to renew the contest on the following day. Jalaluddin had exposed himself very freely in the fight, in hopes, perhaps, that he should be killed. But Genghis Khan had given positive orders that he should be taken alive. He had even appointed two of his generals to watch carefully, and to see that no person should, under any circumstances, kill him. He wished to take him alive, in order to lead him through the country a prisoner, and exhibit him to his former subjects as a trophy of his victory, just as he had done and was still doing with the old queen Cotton, his grandmother. But Jalaluddin was determined that his conqueror should not enjoy this pleasure. He resolved to attempt to save himself by swimming the river. He accordingly went first, breathless, and covered with dust and blood from the fight, to take a hurried leave of his mother, his wives, and his children, who, as was customary in those countries and times, had accompanied him in his campaign. He found them in his tent, full of anxiety and terror. He took leave of them with much sorrow and many tears, trying to comfort them with the hope that they should meet again in happier times. Then he took off his armor and his arms, in order that he might not be impeded in crossing the river, reserving, however, his sword and bow, and a quiver full of arrows. He then mounted a fresh horse and rode toward the river. When he reached the bank of the river, the horse found the current so rapid and the agitation of the water so great that he was very unwilling to advance. But Jalaluddin spurred him in. Indeed, there was no time to be lost, for scarcely had he reached the shore when Genghis Khan himself and a party of Mongols appeared in view, advancing to seize him. They stopped on the bank when they saw Jalaluddin ride into the water among the rocks and whirlpools. They did not dare to follow him, but they remained at the waterside to see how his perilous adventure would end. As soon as Jalaluddin found that he was out of their reach, he stopped at a place where his horse found a foothold and turned round toward his pursuers with looks of hatred and defiance. He then drew his bow and began to shoot at them with his arrows, and he continued to shoot until all the arrows in his quiver were exhausted. Some of the more daring of the Mongols proposed to Genghis Khan that they should swim out and try to take him. But Genghis Khan would not allow them to go. He said the attempt would be useless. You can do nothing at all with him, said he. A man of such cool and determined bravery as that will defy and defeat all your attempts. Any father might be proud to have such a son, and any son proud to be descended from such a father. When his arrows were all expended, Jalaluddin took to the river again, and his horse, after a series of most desperate struggles among the whirlpools and eddies and the boiling surges which swept around the rocks, succeeded at length in carrying his master over. The progress of the horse was watched with great interest by Genghis Khan and his party from the shore as long as they could see him. As soon as Jalaluddin landed and had recovered a little from the fatigue and excitement of the passage, he began to look around him and to consider what was next to be done. He found himself entirely alone, in a wild and solitary place, which he had reason to fear was infested with tigers and other ferocious beasts of prey, such as haunt the jungles in India. Night was coming on, too, and there were no signs of any habitations or of any shelter. So he fastened his horse at the foot of a tree and climbed up himself among the branches, and in this way passed the night. The next morning he came down and began to walk along the bank of the river to see what he could find. He was in a state of great anxiety and distress. Suddenly, to his great relief and joy, he came upon a small troop of soldiers accompanied by some officers who had escaped across the river from the battle as he had done. Three of these officers were his particular friends, and he was overjoyed to see them. They had made their way across the river in a boat, which they had found 
upon the bank at the beginning of the defeat of the army. They had spent the whole night in the boat, being in great danger from the shoals and shelving rocks and from the impetuosity of the current. Finally, toward morning, they had landed, not far from the place where Jalaladin found them. Not long after this, he came upon a troop of three hundred horsemen who had escaped by swimming the river at a place where the water was more smooth at some distance below. These men told him that about six miles farther down the stream there was a body of about four thousand men who had made their escape in a similar manner. On assembling these men, Jalaladin found himself once more at the head of a considerable force. The immediate wants of his men were, however, extremely pressing, for they were all wholly destitute of food and of every other necessary, and Jalaladin would have been greatly embarrassed to provide for them had it not been for the thoughtfulness and fidelity of one of the officers of his household on the other side of the river. This officer's name was Jamalarazad. As soon as he found that his master had crossed the river, knowing, too, that a great number of the troops had attempted to cross besides, and that, in all probability, many of them had succeeded in reaching the other bank, who would all be greatly in want of provisions and stores the next morning, he went to work at once during the night and loaded a very large boat with provisions, arms, money, and stuff to make clothing for the soldiers. He succeeded in getting off in this boat before his plan was discovered by the Mongols, and in the course of the next morning he reached the opposite bank with it, and thus furnished to Jalaladin an abundant provision for his immediate necessities. Jalaladin was so much pleased with the conduct of Jamal Arazad in this affair that he appointed him at once to a very high and responsible office in his service and gave him a new title of honor. In the meantime, Genghis Khan, on the other side of the river, took possession the next morning of Jalaladin's camp. Of course, the family of the sultan fell into his hands. The emperor ordered all the males to be killed, but he reserved the women for a different fate. Among the persons killed was a boy about eight years old, Jalaladin's oldest son. Jalaladin had ordered his treasure to be sunk in the river, intending, probably, to come back and recover it at some future time. But Genghis Khan found out in some way where it was sunk, and he sent divers down for it, and thus obtained possession of it as a part of his booty. After this, Jalaladin remained five or six years in India, where he joined himself and his army with some of the princes of that country and fought many campaigns there. At length, when a favorable opportunity occurred, he came back to his own country and fought some time longer against the Mongols there, but he never succeeded in gaining possession of any substantial power. Genghis Khan continued after this for two or three years in the Mohammedan countries of the western part of Asia and extended his conquest there in every direction. It is not necessary to follow his movements in detail. It would only be a repetition of the same tale of rapine, plunder, murder, and devastation. Sometimes a city would surrender at once when the conqueror approached the gates by sending out a deputation of the magistrates and other principal inhabitants with the keys of the city and with magnificent presents in hopes to appease him and they usually so far succeeded in this as to put the Mongol soldiery in good humor so that they would content themselves with ransacking and plundering the place, leaving the inhabitants alive. At other times the town would attempt to resist. The Mongols would then build engines to batter down the walls and to hurl great stones over among the besieged. In many instances, there was great difficulty in obtaining a sufficient supply of stones on account of the alluvial character of the ground on which the city stood. In such cases, after the stones found near were exhausted, the besiegers would cut down great trees from the avenues leading to the town or from the forest near and, sawing the trunk up into short lengths, 
would use the immense blocks thus formed as ammunition for the engines. These great logs of heavy wood, when thrown over the walls, were capable of doing almost as much execution as the stones, though compared with a modern bombshell, a monstrous ball of iron, which, after flying four or five miles from the battery, leaving on its way a fiery train through the air, descends into a town and bursts into a thousand fragments, which fly like iron hail in every direction around. They were very harmless missiles. In sawing up the trunks of the trees into logs, and in bringing stones for the engines, the Mongols employed the prisoners whom they had taken in war and made slaves of. The amount of work of this kind, which was to be done at some of the sieges, was very great. It is said that at the siege of Nishabur, a town whose inhabitants greatly offended Genghis Khan by secretly sending arms, provisions, and money to Jalaluddin, after they had once surrendered to the Mongols and pretended to be friendly to them, the army of the Mongols employed 1,200 of these engines, all of which were made at a town at some distance from the place besieged, and were then transported in parts by the slaves and put together by them under the walls. While the slaves were employed in works of this kind, they were sometimes protected by wooden shields covered with rawhides, which were carried before them by other slaves to keep off and extinguish the fiery darts and arrows which were shot at them from the wall. Sometimes, too, the places where the engines were set up were protected by wooden bulwarks, which, together with the framework itself of the engines, were covered with raw hides to prevent their being set on fire by the enemy. The number of raw hides required for this purpose was immense, and to obtain them the Mongols slaughtered vast herds of horses and cattle, which they plundered from the enemy. In order to embarrass the enemy in respect to ammunition for their engines, the people of a town, when they heard that the Mongols were coming, used to turn out sometimes in mass several days before, and gather up all the stones they could find, and throw them into the river, or otherwise put them out of the way. In some cases, the towns that were threatened, as has already been said, did not attempt to resist, but submitted at once, and cast themselves on the mercy of the conqueror. In such cases, the Mongol generals usually spared the lives of the inhabitants, though they plundered their property. It sometimes happened, too, that after attempting to defend themselves for some time, the garrison would become discouraged, and then would attempt to make some terms or conditions with the conqueror before they surrendered. In these cases, however, the terms which the Mongols insisted upon were often so hard that, rather than yield to them, the garrison would go on fighting to the end. In one instance, there lived a town that was to be assailed a certain sheik or prince named Kubru, who was a man of very exalted character as well as of high distinction. The Mongol general whom Genghis Khan had commissioned to take the town was his third son, Okte. Okte had heard of the fame of the sheik and had conceived a very high respect for him. So he sent a herald to the wall with a passport for the sheik and for ten other persons such as he should choose, giving him free permission to leave the town and go wherever he pleased. But the sheik declined the offer. Then Okte sent in another passport with permission to the sheik to take a thousand men with him. But he still refused. He could not accept Okte's bounty, he said, unless it was extended to all the Mohammedans in the town. He was obliged to take his lot with the rest, for he was bound to his people by ties too strong to be easily sundered. So the siege went on, and at the end of it, when the town was carried, the sheik was slain with the rest in the streets, where he stood his ground to the last, fighting like a lion. All the Mohammedan chieftains, however, did not possess so noble a spirit as this. One chieftain, when he found that the Mongols were coming, caused himself to be let down with ropes from the wall in the night, and so made his escape, leaving the town and the garrison to their fate. The garrisons of the towns 
knowing that they had little mercy to expect from their terrible enemies, fought often very desperately to the last, as they would have done against beasts of prey. They would suddenly open the gates and rush out in large bands, provided with combustibles of all kinds and torches, with which they would set fire to the engines of the besiegers, and then get back again within the walls, before the Mongols could recover sufficiently from the alarm and confusion to intercept them. In this manner they destroyed a great many of the engines, and killed vast numbers of men. Still the Mongols would persevere, and sooner or later the place was sure to fall. Then, when the inhabitants found that all hope was over, they had become so desperate in their hatred of their foes that they would sometimes set the town on fire with their own hands and throw themselves and their wives and children into the flames rather than fall into the hands of their infuriated enemies. The cruelties which the Mongols perpetrated upon their unhappy victims when, after a long resistance, they finally gained possession of a town were indeed dreadful. They usually ordered all the people to come out to an open space on the plain and there, after taking out all the young and able-bodied men who could be made useful in bringing stones and setting up engines and other such labors, and also all the young and beautiful women, to be divided among the army or sold as slaves, they would put the rest together in a mass and kill them all by shooting at them with arrows, just as if they had been beasts surrounded in a chase excepting that the excitement and pleasure of shooting into such a mass of human victims and of hearing the shrieks and cries of their terror was probably infinitely greater to their brutal murderers than if it had been a herd of lions, tigers, and wolves that they were destroying. It is said by the historians that in one case the number of people ordered out upon the plain was so great that it took four days for them to pass out and assemble at the appointed place, and that, after those who were to be spared had been separated from the rest, the number that were left to be slain was over one hundred thousand, as recorded by the secretaries, who made an enumeration of them. In another case the slaughter was so great that it took twelve days to count the number of the dead. Some of the atrocities which were perpetrated upon the prisoners were almost too horrible to be described. In one case, a woman, quite advanced in years, begged the Mongols to spare her life, and promised that, if they would do so, she would give them a pearl of great value. They asked her where the pearl was, and she said she had swallowed it. The Mongols then immediately cut her down and ripped her body open with their swords to find the pearl. They found it, and then, encouraged by the success and thinking it probable that other women might have attempted to hide their jewels in the same way, they proceeded to kill and cut open a great number of women to search for pearls in their bodies, but they found no more. At the siege of a certain city, called Bamiyan, a young grandson of Genghis Khan, wishing to please his grandfather by his daring, approached so near the wall that he was reached by an arrow shot by one of the archers and killed. Genghis Khan was deeply affected by this event, and he showed by the bitterness of his grief that, though he was so utterly heartless and cruel in inflicting these woes upon others, he could feel for himself very acutely when it came to his turn to suffer. As for the mother of the child, she was rendered perfectly furious by his death. She thought of nothing but revenge, and she only waited for the town to be taken in order that she might enjoy it. When, at last, a practicable breach was made, and the soldiers began to pour into the city, she went in with the rest, and insisted that every man, woman, and child should be put to death. Her special rage was directed against the children, whom she seemed to take special pleasure in destroying, in vengeance for the death of her own child. The hatred and rage which she manifested against children extended even to babes unborn, and these feelings she evinced by atrocities too shocking to be described. The opinions which Genghis Khan entertained on religious subjects appear from a conversation which he held at one time 
during the course of his campaigns in Western Asia, with some learned Mohammedan doctors at Bokhara, which was the great seat at that time of science and philosophy. He asked the doctors what were the principles of their religion. They replied that these principles consisted of five fundamental points. 1. In believing in one God, the creator of all things, and the supreme ruler and governor of the universe. 2. In giving one fortieth part of their yearly income or gains to the poor. 3. In praying to God five times every day. 4. In setting apart one month in each year for fasting. 5. In making a pilgrimage to the temple in Mecca, there to worship God. Genghis Khan told them that he believed himself in the first of these articles, and he approved of the three succeeding ones. It was very well, he said, to give one-fortieth of one's income to the poor, and to pray to God five times a day, and to set apart a month in the year for a fast. But as to the last article, he could not but dissent from it entirely, for the whole world was God's house, and it was ridiculous, he said, to imagine that one place could really be any more fitting than another as a place for worshipping him. The learned doctors were much dissatisfied with this answer. They were, in fact, more displeased with the dissent which the emperor expressed from this last article, the only one which was purely and wholly ritual in its character, than they were gratified with the concurrence which he expressed in all the other four. This is not at all surprising, for, from the times of the Pharisees down to the present day, the spirit of sectarianism and bigotry in religion always plants itself most strongly on the platform of externals. It is always contending strenuously for rights, while it places comparatively in the background all that bears directly on the vital and spiritual interests of the soul. End of chapter 22 Chapter 23, Grand Celebrations, 1221 to 1224. When Genghis Khan found that his conquests in Western Asia were in some good degree established and confirmed, he illustrated his victory and the consequent extension of his empire by two very imposing celebrations. The first was a grand hunt. The second was a solemn convocation of all the estates of his immense realm in a sort of diet or deliberative assembly. The accounts given by the historians of both these celebrations are doubtless greatly exaggerated. Their description of the hunt is as follows. It was after the close of the campaign in 1221 that it took place, while the army were in winter quarters. The object of the hunt was to keep the soldiers occupied so as to avoid the relaxation of discipline and the vices and disorder which generally creep into a camp where there are no active occupations to engage the minds of the men. The hunt took place in a vast region of uninhabited country which was infested with wild beasts of every kind. The soldiers were marched out on this expedition in order of war as if it were a country occupied by armed men that they were going to attack. The different detachments were conducted to the different points in the outskirts of the country from which they severally extended themselves to the right and left, so as completely to enclose the ground. And the space was so large, it is said, which was thus enclosed, that it took them several weeks to march into the center. It is true that in such a case the men would advance very slowly, perhaps only a few miles each day, in order that they might examine the ground thoroughly and leave no ravine or thicket or other lurking place where beasts might conceal themselves unexplored. Still, the circle was doubtless immensely large. When the appointed morning at length arrived, the men at the several stations were arrayed and they commenced their advance toward the center, moving to the sound of trumpets, drums, timbrels, and other such instruments of martial music as were in use in those days. 
The men were strictly forbidden to kill any animal. They were only to start them out from their lurking places and lairs and drive them in toward the center of the field. Great numbers of the men were provided with picks, spades, and other similar tools with which they were to dig out the burrows and holes of such animals as should seek refuge underground. They went on in this way for some weeks. The animals ran before them, thinking, when they were disturbed by the men, that it was only a momentary danger, which they could easily escape from, as usual, by running forward into the next thicket. But soon the advancing line of the soldiers reached them there, and drove them out again. And if they attempted to turn to the right or the left, they soon found themselves intercepted. Thus, as the circle grew narrower, and the space enclosed diminished, the animals began to find themselves mixing with one another in great numbers, and being now irritated and angry, they attacked one another in many instances, the strong falling upon and killing the weak. Thus a great many were killed, though not by the hands of the soldiers. At last the numbers became so great, and the excitement and terror of the animals so intense, that the soldiers had great difficulty in driving them forward. The poor beasts ran this way and that, half distracted, while the soldiers pressed steadily on behind them, and cut them off from every chance of escape by raising terrific shouts and outcries, and by brandishing weapons before them wherever they attempted to turn. At length the animals were all driven into the inner circle, a comparatively small space, which had been previously marked out. Around this space double and triple lines of troops were drawn up, armed with pikes and spears, which they pointed in towards the center, thus forming a sort of wall by which the beasts were closely shut in. The plan was now for the officers and khans, and all the great personages of the court and the army, to go into the circle and show their courage and their prowess by attacking the beasts and slaying them. But the courage required for such an exploit was not so great as it might seem, for it was always found on these occasions that the beasts, though they had been very wild and ferocious when first aroused from their lairs, and had appeared excessively irritated when they found the circle beginning to narrow around them, ended at last in losing all their spirit, and in becoming discouraged, dejected, and tame. This was owing partly, perhaps, to their having become, in some degree, familiar with the sight of men, but more probably to the exhaustion produced by long-continued fatigue and excitement, and to their having been for so many days deprived in a great degree of their accustomed food and rest. Thus in this, as in a great many other similar instances, the poor soldiers and common people incurred the danger and the toil, and then the great men came in at the end to reap the glory. Genghis Khan himself was the first to enter the circle for the purpose of attacking the beasts. He was followed by the princes of his family and by other great chieftains and khans. As they went in, the whole army surrounded the enclosure and completely filled the air with the sound of drums, timbrels, trumpets, and other such instruments, and with the noise of the most terrific shouts and outcries which they could make, in order to terrify and overawe the beasts as much as possible, and to destroy in them all thought and hope of resistance. And indeed, so much effect was produced by these means of intimidation that the beasts, it is said, became completely stupefied. They were so affrighted that they lost all their fierceness. The lions and tigers became as tame as lambs, and the bears and wild boars, like the most timorous creatures, became dejected and amazed. Still, the going in of Genghis Khan and the princes to attack them was not wholly without danger, for, of course, it was a point of honor with them to select the most ferocious and fierce of the animals, and some of these, when they found themselves actually assailed, were aroused again, and recovering in some degree their native ferocity, seemed impelled to make a last desperate effort to defend themselves. 
After killing a few of the lions, tigers, and bears, Genghis Khan and his immediate suite returned to a place at one side of the enclosure, where a throne had been set up for the emperor on an eminence, which afforded a good view of the field. Here Genghis Khan took his seat in order to enjoy the spectacle of the slaughter, and then an immense number of men were allowed to go in and amuse themselves with killing and destroying the poor beasts till they were perfectly satiated with the sight of blood and of suffering. At last some of the Khan's grandsons, attended by several other young princes, approached the throne where the emperor was seated and petitioned him to order the carnage to cease and to allow the rest of the animals to go free. This petition the emperor granted. The lines were broken up. The animals that had escaped being massacred made their way back into the wilds again, and the hunt was over. The several detachments of the army then set out on their march back to the camp again, but so great was the scale on which this grand hunting expedition was conducted that four months elapsed between the time of their setting out upon it till the time of their return. The Grand Diet, or General Assembly, of the states of Genghis Khan's empire took place two or three years later, when the conquest of Western Asia was complete, and the sons of the emperor and all the great generals could be called together at the emperor's headquarters without much danger. The place chosen for this assembly was a vast plain in the vicinity of the city of Tukat, which has already been mentioned as one of the great cities conquered by Genghis Khan. Tukat lay in a central and convenient position for the purpose of this assembly. It was, moreover, a rich and beautiful city, and could furnish all that would be necessary for the wants of the assembly. The meeting, however, was not to be held in the city itself, but upon a great plain in the environs of it, where there was space for all the Khans, with their numerous retinues, to pitch their tents. When the Khans and chieftains began to assemble, there came first the sons of the king, returning from the various expeditions on which their father had sent them, and bringing with them magnificent presents. These presents, of course, consisted of the treasures and other valuables which they had taken in plunder from the various cities which had fallen into their hands. The presents which Juki brought exceeded in value those of all the others. Among the rest, there was a herd of horses, 100,000 in number. These horses had, of course, been seized in the pastures of the conquered countries, and were now brought to the emperor to be used by him in mounting his troops. They were arrayed in bands according to the color, white, dappled gray, bay, black, and spotted, of each kind an equal number. The emperor received and welcomed his sons with great joy, and readily accepted their presents. In return, he made presents to them from his own treasuries. After this, as other princes and khans came in and encamped with their troops and followers on the plain, the emperor entertained them all with a series of grand banquets and public diversions of all sorts. Among other things, a grand hunting party was organized, somewhat similar in the general plan to the one already described, only on a much smaller scale, of course, in respect to the number of persons engaged and the time occupied, while yet it greatly surpassed that one in magnificence and splendor. Several thousand beasts were slain, it is said, and a great number and variety of birds, which were taken by the falcons. At the end of the hunt, a great banquet was given, which surpassed all the other feasts in munificence. They had on the tables of this banquet a great variety of drinks, not only rich wines from the southern countries, but beer, and methaglin, and also sherbet, which the army had learned to make in Persia. In the meantime, the great space on the plain, which had been set apart for the encampment, had been gradually becoming filled up by the arrival of the Khans, until at length, in every direction, as far as the eye could reach, the whole plain was covered with groups of tents and long lines of movable houses brought on wheels. The ground which the encampment covered was said by the historians to have been seven leagues in extent. 
If the space occupied was anything at all approaching this magnitude, it could only be that the outer portions of it were occupied by the herdsmen and other servants of the khans, who had to take care of the cattle and horses of the troops, and to provide them with suitable pasture. Indeed, the great number of animals which these wandering tribes always took with them on their journeys rendered it necessary to appropriate a much larger space to their encampments than would have been otherwise required. It is surprising to us, who are accustomed to look upon living in tents as so exclusively an irregular and temporary expedient, to learn how completely this mode of life was reduced to a system in those days, and how perfect and complete all the arrangements relating to it were made. In this case, in the center of the encampment, a space of two leagues in length was regularly laid out in streets, squares, and marketplaces, like a town. Here were the emperor's quarters, with magnificent tents for himself and his immediate household, and multitudes of others of a plainer character for his servants and retainers. The tents of the other grand khans were near. They were made of rich materials, and ornamented in a sumptuous manner, and silken streamers of various colors floated in the wind from the summits of them. Besides these, there was an immense tent built for the assembly itself to hold its sessions in. This tent was so large, it is said, that it would contain two thousand persons. It was covered with white, which made it very conspicuous. There were two entrance gates leading to the interior. One of them was called the Imperial Gate, and was for the use of Genghis Khan alone. The other was the public gate, and was used in general for the members of the assembly and for spectators. Within the tent was erected a magnificent throne intended for the use of the emperor during the sessions of the assembly. A great amount of important business was transacted by the assembly while it continued in session, and many important edicts were made by the emperor. The constitution and laws of the empire were promulgated anew, and all necessary arrangements made for the government of the various provinces, both near and remote. At length, when these various objects had been accomplished, and the business was concluded, the emperor gave audience individually to all the princes, khans, generals, governors of provinces, and other grand dignitaries who were present on the occasion, in order that they might take their leave preparatory to returning to their several countries. When this ceremony was concluded, the encampment was broken up, and the various khans set off, each at the head of his own caravan, on the road leading to his own home. End of chapter 23 Chapter 24 Conclusion 1227 After the grand convocation described in the last chapter, Genghis Khan lived only three years. During this time he went on extending his conquests with the same triumphant success that had attended his previous operations. Having at length established his dominion in Western Asia on a permanent basis, he returned to the original seat of his empire in the east after seven years' absence, where he was received with great honor by the Mongol nation. He began again to extend his conquests in China. He was very successful. Indeed, with the exception of one great calamity which befell him, his career was one of continued and unexampled prosperity. The calamity was the death of his son, Juki, his oldest, most distinguished, and best beloved son. The news of this event threw the Khan into a deep melancholy, so that for a time he lost all his interest in public affairs, and even the news of victories obtained in distant countries by his armies ceased to awaken any joyful emotions in his mind. The Khan was now, too, becoming quite advanced in life, being about sixty-four years old, which is an age at which the mind is slow to recover its lost elasticity. He did, however, slowly recover from the effects of his grief, and he then went on with his warlike preparations. He had conquered all the northern portion of China, 
and was now making arrangements for a grand invasion of the southern part, when at length, in the spring of the year 1227, he fell sick. He struggled against the disease during the summer, but at length in August he found himself growing worse, and he felt that his end was drawing nigh. His mind was occupied mainly, during all this interval, by arranging the details of the coming campaign, and making known to the officers around him all the particulars of his plans, in order that they might carry them out successfully after his decease. He was chiefly concerned, as well he might be, lest the generals should quarrel among each other after he should be gone, and he continually exhorted them to be united, and on no account to allow discord or dissensions to creep in and divide them. His oldest son, next to Juki, was Jagate, but he was of a mild and amiable temper, and not so well qualified to govern so widely extended an empire as the next son, whose name was Okte. The next son to Okte, whose name was Toli, was with his father at the time when his sickness at last assumed an immediately alarming character. This change for the worse, which convinced the emperor that his death was drawing nigh, took place one day when he was traveling with a portion of his army, being borne on a litter on account of his infirm and feeble condition. A halt was ordered, a camp was formed, and the great conqueror was borne to a tent, which was pitched for him on the spot near the borders of the forest. The physicians and the astrologers came around him and tried to comfort him with encouraging predictions, but he knew by the pains that he felt and by other inward sensations that his hour had come. He accordingly ordered that all of his sons who were in the camp and all the princes of his family should be called in to his bedside. When they had all assembled, he caused himself to be raised up in his bed, and then made a short but very solemn address to them. I leave you, said he, the greatest empire in the world, but your preserving it depends upon your remaining always united. If discord steals in among you, all will most assuredly be lost. Then, turning to the great chieftains and khans who were standing by, the great nobles of his court, he appealed to them, as well as to the princes of his family, whether it was not just and reasonable that he, who had established the empire and built it up wholly from the very foundations, should have the right to name a successor to inherit it after he was gone. They all expressed a full assent to this proposition. His sons and the other princes of his family fell on their knees and said, You are our father and our emperor, and we are your slaves. It is for us to bow in submission to all the commands with which you honor us, and to render the most implicit obedience to them. The Khan then proceeded to announce to the assembly that he had made choice of his son Octay as his successor and he declared him the Khan of Khans, which was the imperial title, according to the Constitution. The whole assembly then kneeled again, and solemnly declared that they accepted the choice which the emperor had made, and promised allegiance and fidelity to the new sovereign so soon as he should be invested with power. The aged emperor then gave to his second son, Jagate, a large country for his kingdom, which, however, he was, of course, to hold under the general sovereignty of his brother. He also appointed his son Tole, who was then present, to act as regent until Octe should return. The assembly was then dismissed, and very soon afterward the great conqueror died. Tole, of course, immediately entered upon his office as regent, and under his direction the body of his father was interred with great magnificence, under a venerable tree, where the Khan had rested himself with great satisfaction a few days before he was taken sick. The spot was a very beautiful one, and in due time a magnificent monument was erected over the grave. Trees were afterward planted around the spot, and other improvements were made in the grounds, by which it became, at length, it was said,
one of the finest sepulchres in the world. As soon as Octe, whom the emperor had designated as his successor, returned home, he was at once proclaimed emperor, and established himself at his father's court. The news of the old emperor's death rapidly spread throughout Asia, and a succession of ambassadors were sent from all the provinces, principalities, and kingdoms throughout the empire, and also from such contiguous states as desired to maintain friendly relations with the new monarch, to bring addresses and messages of condolence from their respective rulers. And so great was the extent of country from which these ambassadors came that a period of six months was consumed before these melancholy ceremonies were ended. The fate of the Grand Empire which Genghis Khan established was the same with that of all others that have arisen in the world from time to time by the extension of the power of great military commanders over widely separated and heterogeneous nations, the sons and successors to whom the vast possessions descended soon quarreled among themselves, and the immense fabric fell to pieces in less time than it had taken to construct it. End of chapter 24 End of the History of Genghis Khan by Jacob Abbott